Good morning. So I am here with Audrey Loria from Wildflower Inc., which is one of our brand new members. And we are going to learn about exactly what Wildflower does. You've been around for quite a while and, um, and in Lexington. And so we want to hear more about it. So welcome. Thank you, Erin. And thank you for um, welcoming me to this program today. I am thrilled to be here. Wildflower indeed was uh, born in 2004. So yes, a long time ago, we've been in business for 17 years. And our founder, Cindy Jones, lost uh, at an early age her husband uh, when she had three very small children. And the idea for Wildflower was born out of her experience. Uh, summers were a very difficult time for her as a single mom, trying to work, trying to juggle being a parent. And so as her children aged, benefited from summer camp experiences, she then later in life, when she was about to be remarried, uh, instead of asking for donation for gifts for their wedding, they began Wildflower with seed money as an alternative way of celebrating their wedding. So oh, she and Steve so Birnbaum got married and in celebration of that, the seed money was planted. And in 2005, Wildflower sent five children to summer camp. That first, that was the first year of support. Uh, since then, we have grown tremendously. Um, we are actually going to support 100 children this summer to go to a variety of camp experiences. So mm -hmm. the thing that all of our children have in common that we support are that one of their parents has passed away, sometimes both parents, but um, they are all, uh, you know, grieving families who have lost a parent. And our mission focused on summer camp initially was because we felt that summer camp was a chance for those kids to enjoy the promise of summer like other kids get to enjoy, making it financially feasible for these uh, families who often experience a loss in financial revenue as a result of the loss. Oftentimes it can be the primary breadwinner who passes away. So um, all, of, all of those things combined. And as I said, we've grown the program a lot. And yes, we are happily located in Lexington. Um, and, and just, yeah, thanks. Pleased to be here. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. I mean, my first question was, what is Wildflower's overall mission? And I think you encapsulated it. I love, by the way, that you use the language of seed money and planting it. Um, I, I assume that that's conscious, but even if it's not, I, I think that's, I think it's wonderful the way you talk about it. It Where was very it... spontaneous this morning, actually. Um, uh -oh. It's probably worth noting that the name Wildflower was, was born out of the idea. Um, Cindy, our founder, is a big hiker, and she went to take a hike uh, in the West, and it was shortly after a really devastating forest fire. And she anticipated that the hike would be very barren and charred and just not much to look at. But the truth is that when forest growth comes down during a, a wildfire, some of the first growth that appears are beautiful little flowers that start to sprout because they're, they're not in the shadows of trees, that, but they're also incredibly resilient and they are the first to resurface. And so it was that idea of kind of the resilience of children and something beautiful coming out of a very tragic experience so that's, that's a beautiful image i love that how so you said 100 children this year how many families have you worked with in the 17 years oh my goodness um you know we typically oh, count good. it yeah we usually count it by by the number of children and the okay. experiences so we are approaching 700 um prior to summer of 2021 we are approaching 700 discrete experiences for kids over the years that's wonderful and is it only children from the lexington area no we service boston the greater Boston area, we loosely use 495 as a as a boundary. Okay. So Metro West is a very big part of our population and our outreach efforts. Um, we have a team of 18 volunteers who work with these families. And well, pre-COVID, we encouraged them to visit with their families. So one of the reasons for having 
boundaries on that is to make it feasible for the liaisons to actually do those visits with families and feel that they can be. Um, sure. As I said, COVID has changed a few things. Well, that was another question I was going to ask you. How, how have you adapted because of the pandemic? And it has been, we, like so many other organizations, have really had to pivot our programming. And um, last summer, by the time March came around, we had already negotiated and secured about 440 weeks of camp for our kids. And then day by day, we kept getting more and more calls that the camps we had partnered with were unfortunately not going to be able to open. So instead, we found virtual offerings for any of the kids who were willing to do a little more virtual after doing virtual school. Yes. Um, and I will say that at first they were all like, no, we, we just can't do that. But by midsummer, they were getting bored. So they did <laughs> engage in some wonderful virtual op um, offerings. And um, some of the day camps were able to stay open. So we, we moved kids from camps that were closed to camps that were going to be open. We also, for the first time, funded family trips. So if a family wanted to be able to go visit, uh, you know, the Cape or, or going to see family in Colorado was another example, we helped provide funding to make that happen. We literally were willing to pretty much fund anything that would give the families a chance for some respite and joy during a very difficult summer. That's really wonderful because I, you know, yes, as I'm, I'm a parent, my children's camps were getting canceled and so forth, but I'm, I'm a parent with support and I can only imagine trying to scramble and make new plans if you're also in the midst of, of a family crisis like that. Absolutely, and for our families, many of them reported Many people reported feeling, and still do, report feeling isolated during this very difficult right. time. For a single parent, that isolation is, is even harder because they really are 24-7 providing parenting, even while they may still be very much actively grieving the loss of a spouse. It is, it is a very difficult time. And one additional thing that um, your viewers might not consider is that for these single parents, COVID, the thought of getting ill and the, the potential for loss as the only parent left for their children really added a layer of anxiety to our families. And, and I can't say that it's completely gone yet. It's still a reality for them. Of course, I hadn't, <clears throat> excuse me, I hadn't considered that. Um, and, and do you work with families? What What is the immediacy of the program? Is it, only, is it immediately after loss or how, how long does the family qualify for, for participating in Wildflower? Yeah, so we have families that come to us where their loss was very recent. I mean, I, I have spoken to parents on an initial inquiry where the parent died the week before. A lot of times kids may not be ready to go to camp to be separated from their remaining parents. So we, we take all of that into mind when we accept new families. But a, a very unique aspect of our work is that once we accept the family, and as long as their need exists, we stay with that family for as long as they need us. So our age range is five to 18 years. And a lot of times, immediately, neighbors, communities will rally around a family who has experienced a loss. Over time, there are other families who, you know, their attention gets diverted. It's one of the things that we wanted to be a consistent source of support for these families year after year, even when some of that other communal support and family support might start to wane. Um, right. It's a very important part of our mission. And I will add that as part of that, we realized that beyond summer camp, one of the biggest programs that we've added is adding camp to college support is the name of our program. And we help families through that transition of their teen now getting ready to go to college. So it's a it's become a very large part of our program and we're really, really proud of it. And we think that it's making a difference. I'm sure that it is. It has to be because I mean any any kind of additional support has to be helpful, I, I would imagine. I've not been in that situation myself, but thankfully, but I have to imagine that that any support is very needed. 
I sometimes joke about this because I have a husband. I have two girls who have gone off to college and it wasn't even easy for the two of us to help. And so to be alone in that process would, would be really, really difficult. So I'm so glad that our parents raised the issue with us. They, it was through their feedback that we added this programming. So that's great. Do you notice a difference between what younger kids need as experiences versus what older children do in this process? Absolutely. The youngest of children are very happily engaged in wonderful day camp experiences and opportunities. As children get older, we encourage, we encourage our children when, who they, I don't know, between the ages of 10 and 12, we strongly encourage them to experience summer overnight camp to be away from home, to be in an environment where not everyone knows that you might be the kid who lost mom or dad. You can be who you want to be. You can have that be open or you can keep that to yourself and an opportunity to just be independent, to grow, to have mentors, to be in nature. Like all of those things are so, we, we so firmly believe in the power of overnight camp for that reason. And we also know that it's really helpful to the parent who maybe needs a little time to just not be a parent for a couple of weeks and to just renew, restore, just shore up for the return home and back to school, you know, uh, routines in the fall. So yes, we firmly believe in it. I will also say that even as children outgrow overnight camp, we have funded wonderful um, enriching trips. So we we sent one young lady to India to learn about medicine and empowering women and girls. We've sent kids on um, trips to Costa Rica to do community service. I mean, we, we have wonderful partners in this arena. And um, I will also say that many of our campers who've been with us a long time, they transition to become counselors at the camps oh. they've been going to. So it, yeah, it's very, I mean, I have little goosebumps right now because I, I obviously firmly so believe in, in what we are doing and being with these families for so long, I've seen kids grow from seven years old to now being freshmen in college. And it's, it's truly, it's truly heartwarming. Well, you're providing them with a community as well. I mean, it isn't just, I mean, a lot of, a lot of kids, if they go to a camp year after year, they end up wanting to be a counselor, but I can imagine that that community building is even more important for a child in this situation. Yes, absolutely. And especially if you're feeling kind of, you know, lonely in school and all your friends are celebrating Mother's Day or Father's Day, that that can be a community outside of your school community. And sure. many of the kids, we've actually had experiences where, and it's not uncommon for a teen who has experienced the trauma of losing a parent to have some latent grief oh, sure. uh, rise up. And we have actually been able to camp has been enough of a carrot, if you will, for children who have really struggled that look, if you can, if you can work on this, if you can get better, we can get you to camp. Can you make it? And, and honestly, there's one um, young lady that that absolutely made a difference for her and she continues to thrive. So it's, it's wonderful. Oh, I'm glad. I'm very mm -hmm. glad to hear that. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we had talked about when uh, you first became a member and, and we chatted, you mentioned wanting to expand into underserved areas. So tell me some about, uh, about the work you're doing there. Yeah, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of the families that we serve have financial need. And, uh, and we have a healthy mix of people who, families who live in the suburbs who by all superficial, you know, they're living in a decent home, you know, nothing looks like it has changed that much. We right. know that it has significantly changed. Right. And we wanted to provide and ensure that children from underserved communities also had that same opportunity to benefit from the experience of overnight camp that we know is so helpful. So. This year, um, we found a partner, a wonderful partner, the Epiphany School of Boston. Okay. And we asked them to identify children in their population who had lost a parent. So we're keeping true to our mission. 
And we've identified five children. And um, I'm especially pleased that the Dean of Students there, Johnny Wilson, is actually partnering with us to act as a liaison for those families. Oh. Building trust with those families is incredibly important. So having someone with whom they are already familiar and Johnny, who has so willingly embraced the model of Wildflower, it's, it's a really wonderful union. And we don't intend it to be our last uh, partnership, but it is a pilot. And I will say so far, so good. So we may have to check in at some point to let you know how this went for the kids that we um, welcomed from, from their uh, school. Yeah, please do. You know, one of the uh, benefits of being a chamber member, just to give a little plug for us, sure. <laughs> one of the benefits of being a chamber member is that we happily include information about our members in the newsletters that I send out and we share it on social media and so forth. And I think, you know, we would love to hear updates from wildflowers as, it, as your season progresses. Um, we, yeah, we would love to hear that and, and, right. and have a little, a little update in the okay. newsletter or something. Excellent. Thanks, Erin. Yeah. Happy to clarify that. Yeah. Uh, so tell me, how can Lexingtonians get involved? We know that Lexingtonians have big hearts and they want to support people. We've seen incredible support throughout COVID and, and the small business support, but, but the whole community coming together as well. So how can they get involved with your mission? Honestly, Wildflower would not be able to thrive the way it has without the support of volunteers. We are a, a very small staffed organization. And so volunteer support is, is critical for us to be able to carry out our mission. Um, I would encourage Lexingtonians to visit our website. Uh, should I just say what that is? Yes, or we'll go ahead. Go ahead. yes. <laughs> so it's um, wildflowerforkids.org. And um, I would encourage them to learn more about our mission. There's lots of really wonderful information on the website. And there's also a tab where you can, um, it says, I think how to give or um, uh, donate your time or mm -hmm. whatever, there is a tab. Okay. And um, also though, people could reach out to me directly to our office number, email me, or there is a little, uh, form that you can click on to say I'd like to volunteer and you will get a call from the Lex the, the interested party will get a call from me personally just to talk about the interest level that um you know they have in our organization and where they might be a good fit. Well that's what I was going to ask is what kinds of volunteers do you do you make use of? Yeah so our biggest team of volunteers are our family liaisons and all of those uh, individuals have a background in either social work or um, social services benefiting children so and that includes former teachers, sure. guidance counselors, um, so any kind of background dealing with children you know that could be a possible fit for our family liaison team Mm -hmm. And we have a full functioning board with committees. So we have a development committee. We have some special initiatives around events. Mm -hmm. uh, matter of fact, we're, we're pulling together our resource to do a virtual event, which I will share as I have more information. I will Good. share that with the chamber. Um, and we have a finance committee. So there are lots of places where we can plug in whatever treasure and talent you are bringing to the table. We can, we can probably find a niche. And I imagine financial support is also welcome. Did you hear me say treasure? <laughs> <laughs> yes, financial support is also very welcome. And on the very same uh, tab on the website, there is an option for um, interested parties to donate. And again, though, I'm also willing to speak with someone about how that donation uh, can support us and um, look for ways that the donor could really connect with our organization. and make sure that that's a meaningful donation for the funder. Excellent. So I imagine you're gearing up for this summer. Is there a deadline if, uh, so if there's a family watching this, for example, is there a deadline for getting into this year's programming? Yeah, 2021 is closed at this point. Okay. We, uh, at the end of January, so we typically ask that new applicants have their um, information in by mid-December, typically. Okay. And by the end of January, we typically meet. It is true this year, as it has been for the previous years, we had more applicants than spots. 
So as you might imagine that when we make a commitment to serving a family for as long as they need us, we have to consider those reapplicating, reapplying families first right. before we free up any headcount. So um, we have uh, four children on our wait list for 2021. Um, and, uh, but, and we are already receiving inquiries for support for 2022. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if a family is in crisis at the moment, do you have resources that you can direct them to, I imagine? We absolutely do. Um, as a matter of fact, even those children on our wait list, we will advocate with camps to get tuition reductions, even though we aren't in a position to provide an award this year. So okay. we do a lot of work. We also do referrals out to our bereavement partner agencies who are just so incredible. So the children's room in Arlington is, is one of those and Jeff's place in Framingham. Uh, we are cross-referring organizations and we really team up in support of these families, especially those for whom the loss was very recent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you so much for telling us all about this this morning because it's it is incredibly heartbreaking but very heartwarming as well. I mean it's you you are working with families at a time that is probably the most difficult they will encounter in their lives mm -hmm. and turning it into something really beautiful, a really meaningful experience for both the parents and the children. So thank you very much for for the work that you do. Yeah, thank you so much for for having me and um, I look forward to hearing from some of my Lexington neighbors. I'm sure you will. I'm okay. sure you will because we do get, you know, we, we get very good viewership of these, these videos and um, they, get, they get shared frequently. And I, I really hope this brings you some connections. Great, well, I appreciated the opportunity to share the work that we're doing. Thank you so very much.